Okay. Uh, thank you uh, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to kind of build on what Arnold just talked about a little bit. So there's a lot. Of, he went over some of the symptoms um, that we see at the at the leaf level when you're out in the grove, looking at the individual leaves, um, and kind of identifying the uh, the leaves with HLB. And so we're going to go inside the leaf and then inside the plant um, using some of the visualization tools that I've developed over the past few years to look at citrus in particular and how we can figure out uh, how the bacteria is actually moving around inside the plant. And so that's one of the things that we don't really fully understand yet. We know that the, the psyllid transmits the bacteria into the leaves, and then we, we're starting to understand that it make, makes a pretty quick um, move towards the roots. And then from there, we don't really understand how it's moving around the tree. And so I think if we um, are able to un uh, build kind of a comprehensive understanding of how the bacteria moves around the tree, that can help us uh, to mitigate some of the symptoms later on um, or come up with new strategies or new uh, rootstock uh, cyan combinations that will be more resistant or tolerant to the disease. Um, so if we look at uh, a, healthy, uh, a healthy plant on the left here, it might be a little bit hard to see, but uh, this is a cross section, so just a, a cross section through a leaf, pe a leaf petiole. And what we see that there's uh, this normal healthy development, we'll look at some pictures closer up in a little bit, but there's these distinct, uh, distinct bands of phloem um, that are separated by parenchyma tissue. Um, and so that's, uh, we don't think that in, in healthy trees that there's gonna be much uh, transmission of the bacteria from one of these bundles where the phloem is to another, to another neighboring bundle. Um, and what, what we also see in the healthy tissue is this uh, uh, healthy dividing layer of the cambium um, that's leading to both the development of the, the xylem on the inside here on the left and the rest of the phloem and the parenchyma tissue to the right. If we look at HLB positive, tree, uh, positive uh, leaves or petioles, and in this case, this one's a little bit older, what we see is this whole, uh, this, uh, this area here um, in the healthy trees is nice and the cells are fully developed and they're round. Um, and in, in the HLB positive trees that have had the disease for a little while, um, if we look at it closer up, you can actually see that all that phloem tissue is collapsed um, and, uh, and uh, a lot of the, the parenchyma cells still remain and those are, uh, appear to be you know, at normal size or maybe a little bit smaller, but all that phloem tissue is completely collapsed. And so that's the, that's the tissue that is responsible for transmitting or transporting uh, the carbohydrates that are uh, created in the leaves down into the roots where they're stored um, and used in the rest of the tree and then also go to the fruit um, that helps them sweeten up. And so in uh, the HLB, after following the HLB infection, what we end up with is this, uh, the phloem development is inhibited. Um, and then we also have these phloem cells that are eventually collapse or become plugged. And that's a real problem. And what we're trying to figure out is, so if there are bacteria or something related to the bacteria in this, tissue, in this zone here, how is it making it um, to the new tissue um, infecting the rest of the plant? So how is it moving down? So um, we're trying to figure out uh, uh, what exactly is going on, how the bacteria is moving around. If we look at some longitudinal sections, this is just um, taking kind of like a radial section through the, through the stem or the petiole. Um, again, we see that the phloem tissue in here where the black arrows are uh, in the healthy tree, the cell walls are relatively thin, everything looks fine, the, and, the, and the cells are fully expanded. Um, the fibers also look fine, and the xylem also looks fine here. Um, if we look next door in the HLB infected uh, uh, petioles, uh, we notice that we can notice a couple of things. So the fibers are fine, uh, the xylem is also is fine, and it's really only uh, the phloem that uh, has uh, significant problems. And you can see that it's much, the staining is much darker here. That's primarily because the cell walls are a little bit thicker and there's so much tissue that's kind of collapsed together. And so we would expect uh, the carbohydrates to be moving down this pathway. And if you can imagine here, these cells are nice and uh, wide and open for an easy, uh, easy way to transport those carbohydrates to the plant. Here, all those cells are collapsed and broken down. The other thing that you can notice, and this is something that Arnold uh, uh, just mentioned, was the accumulation of these starch granules, so these purple dots that are kind of scattered all the way through here. So that's part of the starch accumulation, and this occurs in the petioles um, and in other tissue as well. And so that's kind of one of the, um, the, uh, the typical uh, ways that you can identify some of these um, plant, uh, the HLB positive leaves um, using that iodine test um, that's, that's fairly common. And so there's a, the accumulation of these starch granules are there that uh, occurs in all the different tissues. And then the other thing that's interesting that hasn't really been brought up um, 
and hasn't, been, hasn't really been studied yet, are the accumulation of uh, calcium oxalate crystals. And so that's something that, uh, that Jim Graham talked about a little bit, the, the, the role of calcium, um, and some of the other uh, speakers this morning have talked about is the role of calcium. So it comes into play here too. Uh, these calcium oxalate crystals, you can see some of them um, in these cells right here. Uh, there's these sharp, pointy little uh, crystals. You can actually see a really good one um, up on this side. In this cell right here, there's a, a four-corner uh, crystal. And so it does occur in healthy tissue, but it also occurs much more, uh, there's much more, uh, the calcium oxalate crystals are much more prevalent um, in uh, uh, leaves that have the disease, that have HLB. And so you know that this is kind of a common, um, uh, a common symptom of plants uh, that have some sort of disease or some sort of stress. They start producing these calcium oxalate crystals. Uh, and we know that those are, uh, or, or they're believed to be kind of part of an anti-herbivory um, mechanism that the plant uses. So they start to produce these crystals. Uh, we don't know really whether they, you know, they taste bad to the insects or whether because they're sharp and have those edges that the insects will stop. Um, uh, chewing on the leaf, but those are uh, that's another symptom that really hasn't come up um, in the literature recently as far as uh, what's related to HLB. So that's something that's kind of new. Um, Arnold did talk about the starch accumulation in the um, in the trees, and so this is a, a section from a stem um, in a tr in a plant that's been uh, that's had HLB for a little while. Uh, and what we notice is that all these brown little dots that are scattered through here, in the uh, uh, interspersed in the xylem, that's all carbo. Th those are um, that's starch. That's, that's fixed there. So normally that would be um, exported or moved elsewhere in the tree and not stored in the, in the stem. Um, but instead, all these cells are, are, are full. And one of the things that we uh, have started to learn about drought tolerance in trees is that those cells uh, where all that starch is accumulated are really important for uh, helping the tree recover from drought. So often uh, uh, air bubbles will get stuck inside, the, in, inside of the xylem, and those cells that surround the xylem, so these big open spots of the vessels, so these cells that surround the xylem are really important for pumping water back in and getting the, the system functional again. So what's going on with these, or how does this, this starch accumulation, which shouldn't be there, um, how is that, inf or, uh, shouldn't be there at least in this concentration, how is that affecting uh, the plants? And so we think it might be, uh, uh, causing the, the HLB infected trees to become more susceptible to drought. And that's something that we're actively working on. Um, and this is also some, a, a kind of a new finding as far as um, one of the symptoms. If we look on the left, we have a healthy uh, Valencia petiole, and then on the right, we have a, um, a uh, HLB infected petiole. And one of the things, uh, what we've done here is we've stained it with, uh, with FDA, which uh, shows where the, the living cells are. So anywhere there's a bright green spot, there's a living cell. Uh, and what we see is that in the, in, we were just looking in this previous image um, here. Uh, so we're looking at all this tissue that's in between the xylem. And what we see is where these white arrows are is the, that parenchyma tissue that is gorged with, uh, with, with starch, all those starch granules. And all those cells are active and living. Most of them are. All these little bright green spots are active and living in the phloem, uh, or sorry, in the, uh, in the ray parenchyma, and then if we look in the HLB-infected uh, petiole, we don't see any of that at all. We see some autofluorescence um, that's just kind of natural that would happen anyway, uh, but we don't see any of that activity, that uh, this bright, live, living tissue uh, within the xylem. And so we think that that, uh, I think, uh, it's my opinion that that's one of the, um, the things that's causing it. Often what we see is trees with HLB often have, are more susceptible to drought. So I think that really uh, drives home the message that we need to, um, uh, really make sure that the trees are well watered um, and especially the ones that have uh, advanced, advanced symptoms to, to help um, mitigate the disease. And so the other, in, the other thing is that we see a lot of active tissue around the outside. And so this is the area where the cambium, the active cambium development um, and the phloem is, the new phloem is developing. And what we, we just, we don't see that same activity in these, uh, the trees with HLB. Um, so one of the, the uh, visualization tools that I've been developing over the past few years uh, is called high resolution x-ray computed tomography. And so that's a big uh, string of words there. But what it is is basically a, a CAT scan that's based on the same principles as a medical CAT scan, um, but it's uh, at a much smaller scale. And so uh, we can basically take a stem um, and put it in. We can either take a live, a live plant or we can take an excised piece of tissue. We can put it in this instrument and we can look at the organization of the cells in three dimensions. Um, whereas before we would have to take multiple uh, uh, serial 
uh, sections through the stem using light, mi light microscopy. What we can do is this, it's a submicron resolution. We can use it to do 2D or 3D imaging. And in about an inch of tissue, we can get 4,000 cross sections. And so to try to do that with a traditional light microscopy is pretty difficult. So what we can do is we can look at, uh, look at some similar uh, types of sections. So we've got a, a transverse or a cross section here displayed, and then we can also display a longitudinal section at the same time. And the really powerful thing I think about this visualization tool is that we can remove this uh, longitudinal plane here and replace it with a three-dimensional um, uh, representation of what the different types of cells are. And so in the purple, we've got the... Um, uh, the parenchyma tissue, the green is the phloem cells, the red is the, the rays, and then the blue is the, is the xylem. And so we can start to look at these organi the organization of the xylem and the phloem in 3D, and then hopefully we can get to the point where we can figure out how the bacteria are moving around. So we know that they're in this green area in the phloem, well, what sort of uh, pathways are there around the stem? If we look using the same technology, if we look at longitudinal sections through a healthy petiole or a petiole with HLB, we notice the same things as, and, we, and we can kind of see the same thing as we did with uh, traditional light microscopy. If we look in here, the phloem looks okay. Um, we can actually see some sieve plates. Uh, everything looks good. Um, where this white arrow is here on the HLB positive tree, the phloem is completely collapsed again. And one of the other interesting things uh, to note is that uh, that prevalence of calcium oxalate crystals again. So these bright white spots, anywhere you see these really bright white spots, those are all calcium oxalate crystals. And so it's packed, whereas you don't really see any at all. And then if you look up close, um, you can also see uh, the large accumulation of uh, carbohydrates and stored starch there in the, in the petiole. So we're trying to use this, again, like I said, to, to understand the potential pathways for the spread of the bacteria through the tree. So right now, um, if we look at a cross-section of a petiole, and this happens to be a healthy one because it's easier to visualize, um, this is kind of hard to understand, but using the 3D uh, visualization tools that we've developed, we can start to understand which of these cell types are which um, and try to figure out what the potential pathways are. And so I mentioned before that there's these healthy, in a healthy uh, petiole, there's these uh, bundles, the discrete bundles of phloem in green, and then they're surrounded by this parenchyma tissue in purple. And then if we try to think about what the possible way is, so how could the bacteria be moving around? So it either, it's probably either moving through one of the two parts of the vascular system, so it's either the phloem or the xylem. So far, nobody has shown that there's any uh, evidence of the bacteria being present in the, in the xylem, but we haven't ruled it out yet. So that's something that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. Um, but we could, cons well, how might it get there? So we know that in the disease tissue, there's this band of, uh, within the, the cambial zone where all that development is going on and all that tissue is compressed together. And so it may be a possibility that the bacteria is moving from the rapidly dividing uh, phloem or the, the phloem that's trying to divi uh, divide and develop from the cambium and somehow makes its way <clears throat> through the ray cells and then into, into the vessels. And then maybe it's moving through the vessels, of, uh, maybe it's moving through the plant that way. Um, so right now there's no direct evidence that it happens, but we know that this is a pathway for carbohydrate movement from the phloem through the rays and into the, in, into the vessels. And so we know that's a the pathway that, that does exist uh, for small molecules and whether it's uh, a matter of whether or not the bacteria are able to move through that same pathway or not. But it is a possible way that it could be spreading. And so once it gets into the xylem, it's a much more, it's a much more low resistance pathway. So you can imagine that the bacteria maybe get down into the roots <clears throat> after feeding on the, on the shoots and then find their way into the xylem and then that's a, that's a you know, kind of a, a super highway up to the rest of the, the tree and where it can be easily dispersed. So we're setting up some experiments to do some girdling and grafting experiments to test this out to see whether or not the bacteria can actually move through the xylem or the phloem. Um, and in this case down here in B, what we're planning on doing is having two, these, uh, these lines here on either side represent two, uh, two branches or two, tree, two separate small trees, um, uh, kind of greenhouse sized trees that have been grafted together. We girdle uh, around, the uh, around the bottom of this tree to remove all of the phloem and then attach a uh, HLB positive uh, bud or we can have some of the tissues below um, have uh, HLB in infected uh, psyllids feed on that tissue and then see when we start to see the symptoms of HLB um, develop. And so this would be in a split pot 
uh, sort of uh, scenario. And so this is isolating the, the, uh, the spread of the bacteria only to the, only to the xylem and to figure it out. And so we'd be doing uh, PCR tests and testing on the, on the tissue from both of the sides at different periods of time to see if, an, if, an, uh, if the bacteria can actually move through the xylem or not. And so I think that'll um, help us under, give us a better understanding of how, th how this whole, uh, how the bacteria is moving through the plant. And there's a number of other um, uh, girdling and grafting experiments that we're going to try to do. Uh, in this case, uh, in particular, we'd take um, a, a plant with two uh, branches, take a uh, HLB positive bud and put it on the opposite side of the branch to see if it can actually move around the uh, move around the branch to see if there's any lateral movement of the bacteria, whether it's hopping from one um, of those uh, one of those vascular or those uh, flow bands of phloem to the next, or whether it's limited to kind of a unidirectional movement in the plant. And so I think figuring out uh, how the bacteria is moving around is going to tell us why uh, if we start to develop new um, uh, cyan rootstock combinations, why those are, are being particularly effective at um, either n not allowing the disease to spread or being tolerant of the disease because it's you know, limited to a, a single part of the tree. And so this is an example of one of those uh, trees that we ha already have in the greenhouse. Um, if we overlay a little map here, so in this case, uh, we would have the two different trees and they're grafted together. And then we can do a girdling experiment where we would either girdle um, a top uh, up here and then add a bud uh, and that type of thing. So this, these uh, grafting experiments certainly work. There's actually one in the background there too, these two, the split pot experiment where we've got the, um, the two different trees grafted together. And so these are some of the, the experiments that we're getting up and running um, in the greenhouse. Um, one of the other things that I've been developing, so in, uh, in addition to the high-resolution CAT scan, is using MRI to, to look at citrus. Um, and in the, one of the advantages of using MRI is that it, um, it's a, again, it's non-destructive, but we can also look at the, the flow rates of the, the, the velocity of the flow of either the xylem or the phloem in real time and in a, in a real plant. Um, and so this is... Uh, it, this is basically just like a shrunken down version of a medical MRI. So normally the patient would be laying on the bed there and they'd roll them in. And in this case, uh, this is actually a grapevine here, but the, the same thing works for citrus. And so you lay your patient down uh, on the bed and roll it in inside the magnet. And we were able to get these images of the, of the live plant. So again, it's non-destructive. Uh, we can do live imaging of sap flow, whether it's the flow uh, velocity of the xylem or the phloem. And then we can also do some 3D and 2D imaging. The other interesting thing that we've been working on with uh, some of the people in Gainesville is that we can start to look at live, or we can look at fruit too. And we can look at fruit uh, development over time. So in, in uh, plants that have been infected with HLB versus those that haven't, and kind of tr figure out how the development changes in the two different uh, in the two different cases. And so these are some cross sections and I'll show a couple of movies here in a second. Um, but this is an MRI of, li of li uh, imaging of living uh, of live tissue. And so the top three are just, a, this is a Valencia uh, orange that was scanned. Um, uh, and you're just looking at three different angles. Some of the interesting things, and I'll point these out when the movie comes up. So you can see the individual segments and you can see the individual vesicles and things like that. Um, and there's, you can see the seeds and all sorts of things. This is a, um, a three dimensional uh, rendering of uh, the original 2D data set. And then the last part that I'm most interested in is trying to f and, uh, is figuring out uh, how to use this technology to look at stems. And so this, is, this stem here is um, about the diameter of a pencil. And you can see all these little white dots. And in both of these um, are the xylem vessels that are filled with water. And then what we can see out here on the edge, this bright ring, is uh, the active uh, layer of uh, phloem and cambium, where there's a high water content. And so what we can do is we can use this instrument to look at a plant over time uh, to, uh, to look at how fast the flow rate, uh, flow rate is in a live plant. So rather than having to stick um, um, some sort of a probe inside the plant, to get a proxy method for how fast the, the phloem uh, the, or the xylem sap is moving, we can look at this in real time in a live plant uh, without doing any uh, modification to it. So I'm going to, OK, so it's going to go ahead and play. And so this is, again, is the, the HLB um, infected orange. And so this is just going slice by slice through the, uh, uh, through the orange. And so planning on using this to study the development of the tissue and how uh, one of the interesting things that you can see in this, uh, in this movie, I think it's going to play again. Um, is that it is lopsided, and so that's kind of one of the typical symptoms that you see uh, in the HLB-infected fruit, uh, or plants from the HL, or fruit from the HLB-infected plants, is this lopsidedness, and you can actually see it um, a little bit here. So this one's quite a, quite a bit lopsided. So there's something going on on one side of the fruit um, that is not allowing it to develop properly, um, and whereas the other side of the fruit is developing normally. 
So this is just uh, another, Im uh, another movie here. So this is taking those images that we just looked at and turning it into a 3D, uh, 3D volume rendering, a 3D image of the fruit. And we can turn it around and, spin it, and spin, at, spin it and look at it in different angles. And we can do all sorts of volume measurements and things like that um, that are not really possible with, you know, if you're to dissect an individual fruit. The other thing is that you can look at the same fruit um, throughout a growing season. So you can have it growing, in the gr uh, growing outside in a pot. And you can bring this, we can just take it inside, put it into the MRI, and repeatedly scan it over a, a, number, of, uh, a number of months to really figure out how the development is changing in the different, in the different plants. And so the, the last thing I'll talk about, again, is this MRI imaging of sap flow through the xylem. And so what we're really interested in is when does the sap flow uh, uh, change direction? And so we know that the predominantly the, the, the phloem is, is moving the carbohydrates down. So the flow is, is, is from the leaves and down to the roots um, uh, for most of, the, most of the year. And so uh, as, the, as the carbohydrates are fixed in the leaves, they're getting pumped down to the roots for storage. And we think that the bacteria uh, responsible for HLB is following that carbohydrate stream from the leaves down into the roots. But if we think about that, you know, if there's a single branch that's infected, the bacteria travels down to the roots and start to proliferate. Um, at some point, for the rest of the tree to be infected, if it's following that pathway and only traveling through the phloem, the direction of that sap flow needs to reverse at some point during the year. And we know that there's some of that that does go on, um, but we don't really understand the dynamics of that. So one of the things that this, the MR, using the MRI can tell us is that we can scan it maybe once a month over the course of a year and really start to understand uh, when the directionality of that flow starts to change. Um, and so again, these bright spots here um, are the xylem vessels, and we can look at the flow in the xylem, and we can also look at the, uh, at the flow rate in the phloem as well, in this bright area around the edge in the cambium and the, and the phloem. And so I think these, uh, these visualization techniques kind of taken as a whole will give us a new uh, perspective on how to uh, study this disease and study the the, uh, how the bacteria moves around the plant, um, both from the 3D visualizations with the, uh, the high-resolution CT and then with the MRI as well, using kind of these uh, new techniques that have trickled down from the medical field and use these, in, uh, use these to study plants and make some comparisons between the old cyan rootstock combinations that we've been using in the past that are susceptible to disease uh, with some of these new ones that uh, uh, people like uh, Jude Grosser um, and Fred Gmitter are coming up with that are more resistant or tolerant to the disease. And I think we'll eventually come to the point where we, th there's, there's going to be some differences in how these uh, the, either the flow rates or the connectivity of all the, the, of the vascular system are different between them and we should get a better understanding um, of how the disease moves around the plant. Um, so I'll thank uh, Ed Echeverria who um, uh, kind of switch pl or I switched places with him to give the talk today. Um, Mary Reed, my technician, and Diane Aker, um, in the who are helping to do some of the microscopy, and uh, Pedro Gonzalez as well, who's Ed's um, uh, lab technician. Uh, and we get our, uh, just got uh, funding from the Citrus Research and Development Foundation um, to do those grafting and girdling experiments that I was just talking about. Um, and I think it's going to give us a real um, boost in our understanding of how this, the, the bacteria moves around. And then hopefully that will lead to new uh, management solutions in, in the future. So uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you.